So I was having lunch with our next speaker. David, I hope you can hear us behind those curtains there. Uh, I was having lunch with him, and uh, David's son, Michael, is uh, a freshman here at Georgetown. And I was telling David that uh, it's a house full. We had to close registration because there was so much demand. And David asked me, do you think Michael will be able to sneak in? Uh, I said, yeah, sure, we can make it happen. Okay. And uh, I'm going to introduce Michael here. Michael is a freshman here. And Michael is going to introduce Dad. Thank you, Professor Agarwal. Uh, I would like to introduce my father, David Rutter. He is a founder and chief executive officer of R3CEV. With over 30, 30 years of experience, he has become a thought leader in financial markets and innovation, steering some of Wall Street's top institutions. Prior to his role at R3CEV, he served for 10 years as CEO of Electronic Broking at ICAP, the world's largest inter-dealer broker, where he led the broker tech, fixed income, and EBS foreign exchange platforms. I'm honored to introduce him at the DC Blockchain Summit. Please help me in welcoming David Rutter. Thank you, Michael. That was very nice. You guys aren't the only uh, father-son duo here. The Tapscots are here. Oh, is that right? My mom and my dad are here. <laughs> so. Well, I met mom backstage, yeah. you know. That was a nice introduction. You'd think the kid would listen to me a little bit, you know, if I have, <laughs> with that kind of resume, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Uh, anyway, so thank you for having us. Oh, absolutely. It's a truly honor to have you here, David. And what you have managed to do with our three... I would argue is perhaps the greatest accomplishment to date in the industry. What R3 has done is get the banks in the room at the same time <laughs> and to discuss blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Um, truly a, a, an amazing amount of work that you've, you, you've done just by assembling that group. Thank um, you. Wh what, is that, what, what inspired you to do this? I mean, of all, of all the, the ways in which blockchain could be applied, um, what, what was the inspiration for the formation of R3? So uh, the inspiration is, uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but I'll keep it really short. But thank you for the kind words. And yes, it's been, uh, it's been a, an interesting couple years. You have to be really ambitious and partially insane to try to bring together 80 global competitive banks uh, and, and get them excited about, about a vision. But really quickly, uh, the way it all started for me is that, uh, as, as Michael mentioned, I was the CEO of BrokerTech and EBS, and for those that don't know what that is, they're uh, an F, the largest uh, FX and fixed income trading platforms. So I was very accustomed to trying to introduce uh, technology to big global banks, and it's very, very hard to do. Um, so I had a little bit of, uh, I, I left ICAP, and I had a little bit of a break, and I you know, began to try to figure out Bitcoin, and I really had trouble wrapping my head around it. Uh, but I started a firm, R3CEV, which, by the way, for the record now, is just R3. Uh, we've grown up enough that we've lost the letters. Um, what does that stand for, anyways? Okay, so, so that's, that's, it's originally started as consultants, exchanges, and ventures. And then I was, uh, we were creative enough once we started doing some investments in Bitcoin to, to turn the consultants to crypto exchanges and ventures. And then we kind of morphed away from that as well. But that kind of... Uh, helps tee up the story of the inspiration of it all. So, uh, so I hired a couple guys. I had a pretty good run on Wall Street, so I started my own venture fund. I didn't know if I'd be any good at it, so I didn't raise any external money. Uh, Bitcoin was super hot. It was the height of the, uh, of, of the hype cycle. And in 2014, we went out to California and we met 20 different firms that were raising money. We actually made two investments. Uh, but what amazed me is that there were a bunch of really smart kids that were uh, getting behind this thing called Bitcoin. And in their minds, they were going to replace the DTCC, CLS, JP Morgan, and some other pretty significant financial institutions in two to three years. Didn't happen. And what amazed me is they were able to raise millions of dollars on, on what was a pretty poor business plan from my perspective, having had 30 years 
in finance, and I was driving on the 405 or 110 or something. I can't remember the, the highways very well. And it dawned on me I, see, I had seen something similar in 1999 and 2000 in the internet craze uh, where there's a ton of money raised on, on some ideas and how the internet was going to change banking. Well, the internet really impacted the media business, but only impacted banking on the fringes. Uh, so I had this light bulb moment, I suppose, where I thought that not Bitcoin, but the technology inspired by Bitcoin, the idea of being able to push immutable records of transactions into the cloud. You know, that idea could be to banking what the internet was to media. And if Time Warner woke up early enough, it could have been a very different result. So I went back to all my big, uh, my big bank contacts and, and started, uh, you know, started R3. And because the technology was, uh, it was so early days, I refused to do what a normal you know, startup would do, which is say, I am going to fix something and, uh, and try to raise money that way. Instead, I said, I have no bloody idea what I'm going to fix, but there's something in this. And I had had the experience, the gravitas, and, and the contacts, and hired some really smart people in order to get the banks to believe in, 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 in pursuing a journey with us to investigate what the technology really could do for the industry. The R3 model is, is different and it's very interesting. It's a collaborative model. So you have over 80 members, mostly yes. banks. Um, we're a trade association, so we're a nonprofit. We're not building any technology. You guys right. are actually building technology. But what problems are you guys looking to solve? So if you look at this, we have built a piece of technology uh, called Corda. It's our own open source platform. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that we can, everyone in this room, is I think we're beyond, beyond whether blockchains or distributed ledgers you know, will have a meaningful impact on, on the future of finance and, and, and from the future of health records and the future of supply chain finance and the future of a lot of different things. So we, we've kind of moved beyond that and now I know it's just a matter of when. Uh, what we're doing at R3 is we're using, we're taking advantage of our, our network of these 80 geographically dispersed uh, financial institutions, mostly banks, we do have a couple insurance companies, uh, to work on numerous experiments to try to figure out what, uh, what's going to fly. So we have work being done in payments, a lot of work being done in payments, uh, post-trade processing, uh, smart contracts for derivatives, um, reg reporting and the like. So uh, we have a number of different interesting use cases um, at R3. Why the collaborative model as opposed to a consulting model where you have a, the, the customer or the client and you're working with them individually? You've done, what you've done is you've bring 80 different members together right. and that's kind of the basis for how you build your products like Corda. So wh why are we taking that approach? So um, one thing that, that I was certain about early on was that in order to achieve the real uh, promise of this technology, uh, you can't use a blockchain or, or, or distributed ledgers in isolation. So, so you need the network. And given my experience and how hard it is to, for trans, transformational technologies uh, to take hold in the financial uh, markets, you know, we chose to, to work collaboratively. And I, you know, I think that uh, while it can be difficult that that is the right route, it also uh, gives us a chance to leverage our membership. We've had over 1,500 individuals from our members contribute work product to R3. Uh, and that's everything from contributing to the, to the core software to helping us write white papers and the like. So, so it makes us smarter. It makes everyone else that's involved uh, smarter. And I saw uh, one thing in the press that I thought kind of summed it all up. I think it might have been Richard uh, Crook from RBS said it, and he, he said, well, distributed ledger technologies need to be collaborative because it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a decent way to look at it. Are there any, uh, I guess, collaborative models that, we, that you look to to use as a guide to build R3? When we yeah. launched our blockchain alliance, this is our initiative where we work with law enforcement. Um, we modeled it after InfraGuard, which was um, a very similar public-private like partnership, but it worked on issues for the internet. So any, any, I guess, consortia or collaborative efforts that worked in the past that were an inspiration or that you've kind of modeled R3 after? Yeah, so the, the first thing I want to mention is that this is my, the fifth consortium I've been involved in. 
Uh, but if you look back in the history of, of finance, there's a lot of great examples where the industry came together to solve problems. Some of them are utility, like, like DTCC and, and CLS um, and, and many other examples. And others are, are you know, for-profit companies like R3. And, and a great example of that would be, would be Market Partners that is now part of Market IHS. It's a $15 billion publicly today. traded company. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, it's a great company. Lance Ugal is the CEO and has done a fine job. So, uh, and, I, and I sought advice from him when I was putting this together. So I think that uh, you know, that's the kind of model. But there's market access in, in TradeWeb and FXL, and there's so many other examples of that collaboration working. It's painful on the way in, but it's... Uh, it's sticky, and, and you can really leverage uh, your, your customer members as you're building out the technology. I want to talk about disruption. And you, you mentioned in, in the early days, there were these companies that were raising money off of this idea that they're going to put JP Morgan out of business, and that yeah. hasn't happened yet. But there, there still is this question of, well, how is this technology going to potentially change banks? So what do you say to, to, to banks or financial institutions that haven't joined R3 or that are not paying? I say it? join. Well, you know, <laughs> it only costs 250000 a year. It's a bargain. I mean, that's what, that's what I tell them. But I'm a salesman. But what's so, the risk to not to not pay attention? Uh, well, that's there's two things. Let's let's examine them individually. So, so the risk to not paying attention is uh, is absolutely massive. Uh, there's been plenty of research, and, and you know I don't I don't quote the research. Uh, we do write some of our own research, but we haven't examined the savings. But the savings across the industry are measured in tens of billions a year. Some say well over 100 billion a year. If you look at global payments, it's a ridiculously inefficient, uh, very costly system. So if you're a bank or an insurance company or a financial institution, and by embracing this technology, you can save your company uh, tens or, or, or 100 million a year, it's, it's pretty almost borderline irresponsible not to pay attention to it. And I know very few companies that, uh, that, that, that aren't putting at least some resources into it. One of the things that R3 provides is, a, is a, a way to get access to other people's work so you can save yourself a ton of money and, and not having to do it all yourself. So, so with R3, I think that uh, obviously Corda was designed uh, uh, for regulated financial institutions uh, with banks and insurance companies and exchanges in mind. They participated right from the whiteboard sessions um, so we're going to be, I hope, a force to, to be reckon, uh, reckoned with and, and certainly a thought leader and, and help create standards that are necessary to make this work. So uh, I think that if you're a, a big company, you know, you want a front row seat for that. Um, if you don't join R3, that's fine. You can be a customer later. But if you want to affect the outcome, if you want to... Salesman right here. Yeah, if you, if you want to participate and make sure that your interests are, uh, you know, are, are covered... I think membership is a, a good idea, but of course I'd say that. Absolutely, and uh, R3 was recently uh, and it caught itself in a little bit of controversy um, based on some slide presentation that was somehow um, leaked or got in the media somehow, but it said, we don't need blockchain. And everyone kind of freaked out. What are they talking about? And so I'm gonna give you the chance to tell the full story um, and it was just one side of a presentation, so obviously, however this got yeah. out, they had no context to it. So what, what did you guys mean by that? Well, well a couple things. Uh, first off, that, that was quite a stir, and they say <laughs> that, uh, that you know, all press is, is good press or something like that, and I totally disagree with that. We, we, you know, uh, we, we, we get a lot of press, and I, was, I had a really busy period going on, so a couple of days had gone by, and... People kept saying, Dave, you got to pay attention to this. There's, there's all sorts of stuff being written. And uh, it, was a, it was a couple of days till I really paid attention uh, to the story. And then I wrote a, a, a blog about it. So I think the, th the way to think about this is blockchain has become synonymous with uh, distributed ledger technology. It's used, it's been conflated, and it's used in the, in the same vein. Uh, blockchain is a, is, is a very fundamentally important piece of technology for trustless systems like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, where you're going to run a proof of work or some other sort of uh, calculation to make sure that there's not the double spend uh, issues. But it's all based on, on trust. 
from the very start, the, the customers that we're aiming towards, they have ISDA documents in place. They, they transact billions of dollars with each other every day. And given my background, and I started as a Fed funds broker, so I've, I have transacted a billion dollars worth of, of, uh, of euro dollar time deposit on the phone, and, and it was all just based on trust. So uh, from the very start, we never uh, designed a blockchain. Um, I think that we fell into the trap with everyone else in, in, uh, you know, in, in referring to it as blockchains. Many, many people, I'm not going to pick on her. And she, was her she was here earlier. I'm not going to say who she is, but you know, she'll use blockchain too. And, and she, you know, uh, with permission ledgers, you don't really need the blocks. You can enter those uh, transactions directly to the ledger. So, so, the, the so there's difference. nothing in the story. We're not a blockchain. If someone wants to write about that again, we'll get our PR people to follow up on it. But um, it's, it was never in the design. It's not necessary. It's much more efficient in permission ledgers to not have blocks. And that distinction between now, what we're well, first making the distinction between Bitcoin and blockchain. Now I feel like the distinction we're making is blockchain and distributed ledger technology. That's right. Right. And, and also, some of the uh, technology that's been inspired by Bitcoin you know, may not even rely on super distributed ledgers. You, know, you don't need hundreds of nodes or even dozens of nodes. The way Corda itself is set up is that only those that need to know about the transaction, which could be just the two counterparties, uh, need necessarily uh, to be part of that consensus algorithm and the confirmation process. And then if a regulator hangs off of that, that that's fine, too. And at the chamber, we are technology agnostic because we have members that... Well, you have to work on that. So you really have to kind of move towards quarter. <laughs> well, as a, I will not be we'll the R3 that salesman. After, that's yeah. your job. Okay. My job is to work with the regulators and... Um, well, they got to move towards quarter, too. I'll let you be okay. the salesman on, okay. on that okay. one. Um, but our membership is very broad in that we work with a lot of different types of companies that are using a lot of different types of blockchain-based technologies. And we don't take a, a position on that. Our job is to educate on the pros and cons and make sure businesses have the best technology right. for their particular product and service and wants and needs and, and regulatory requirements. And in working with financial institutions, this is obviously one of the most regulated areas in the entire world. So Correct. you guys are investing a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources into also these regulatory debates. From your perspective, what is needed on the regulatory front? Um, so, so one observation I'll, I'll make is that I actually think that there's so much work being done on the technology that that's no longer the long pole in the tent as far as the adoption of this technology going forward. Um, you have both the, the, the kind of legal underpinnings that are necessary to evolve to, um, you know, to guide smart contracts uh, that are done on distributed ledgers. And then, of course, you need the regulators to, to understand and to, to allow uh, for the development of the technology. So early on, um, I have this guy, Charlie Cooper, he's from Washington, and he was chirping in my ear about how we really need to invest in the regulatory side. And uh, I didn't appreciate how prescient that was at the time. Um, but we've, we've put a lot of money and a lot of effort into reaching out to the, to the regulators. Uh, I've been involved directly myself. It's been great to see how uh, the regulators' view of this has changed from a couple years ago, you know, fear and concerns about Bitcoin and how could, that could impact somebody's IRA, to a true appreciation uh, that this is uh, the best thing that could happen to them and their ability to regulate markets. The idea of getting an immutable uh, record of a transaction uh, in the cloud and available to the regulators you know, almost immediately as opposed to the way things are done today when transactions are, are um, completed and, and ultimately reconciled sometimes a day or so later, corrupting databases and the like. Uh, the, the, the world, if we think about the future state of all transactions being done in the cloud and being available to the regulators, you can, you can imagine that they would have a view of the entire market and any participant in it, and they could use uh, basic AI, artificial intelligence, and data mining tools to really uh, advance the way they, uh, they observe market 
uh, you know, transactions and interactions and become much better at their jobs. So we spent a lot of money on it. Uh, Isabel is here. I thought she was in the front row, but uh, oh, she is in the front row. So if any, she's head of our reg affairs. If anyone wants to talk more about this, Isabel's in the corner. I think she's met with over 100 regulators. I mean, I've seen her travel bills. They're absolutely ridiculous. So I hope she's meeting with all those regulators. <laughs> um, and so she'd be the great person to talk to. All right, we have time for uh, one more question. You guys are working with the Securities and Future Commission of Hong Kong, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Bank of Canada. So you're doing work with a lot of central banks. I think this is fascinating. What are you doing? <laughs> so uh, in each case, we're doing something a little different. But of course, we're sharing the information. And, and uh, so let's pick two of those. And we can talk about how, how, how it's evolved. So Project Jasper is a project that includes the Bank of Canada, several of the banks, uh, the, all the big Canadian banks, and the Canadian Payments Association. And what it examines is uh, banks posting collateral at the central bank being an issue to Canadian dollar token, which they can then use to settle interbank payments in real time. Um, and and as, as you know, one of the advantages in, uh, in using tokens is that you can break it up in large pieces or small pieces, so it creates a great deal of flexibility. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting. It's beyond just an experiment. We've built a prototype, uh, and that's advancing. Uh, on uh, with MAS, we're and actually Jasper was Canada. And Jasper was Canada. MAS project. We have weird project names, and I have no idea where we come up with them. But I've got a lot of PhDs that come up with these crazy names, but the... Uh, Get your marketing folks on those. Yeah, so, so the MAS project is called UBIN, U-B-I-N, and what UBIN is, is an examination of actually getting a true representation of Sing Dollar onto a distributed ledger, and then issuing uh, bonds that would, you know, pay their dividends and, and be settled in, in Sing Dollar. Now, tying it all together, uh, we've shared the information that's going on in Jasper with the participants in Ubin and vice versa. And then, of course, we've done some stuff with Hong Kong, and we have, we have a big project going in Australia right now. So for me, it's really, you know, I've been uh, in the markets for a very, very long time. And uh, I really think this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to change the way uh, we process transactions, and I, I mean transactions very broadly, not just bonds and FX, but you know, trade finance and, and, and the like. And uh, so it's created a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy to try to solve problems, and I've never seen the regulators so, so excited and proactively involved. So we're gonna keep them involved, we continue to expand. We, there was an announcement yesterday about one of the states in, in, in the US uh, joining our RegNet. And so we work collaboratively uh, through our lab with the regulators once again to try to raise everyone's uh, uh, you know, knowledge and understanding about the potential of this technology. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, massive accomplishments with our three. Congratulations and look forward to having you back at Georgetown again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.